Good morning. Uh, I've decided to take um, a short break from doing long uh, videos like Foundation and Assyrian um, and do some, uh, maybe a short one here and there, at least one short one. So here's a short one. Um, okay, so in 1986, this is the year that Vernon Howell began his polygamy. Um, he, we were living at the beginning of 1986, Vernon Howell and others in the group were living in Highland Park at a house that my parents owned, which is a district of um, Los Angeles. It's in the, it's in northern Los Angeles. So um, he, around, I don't know, I guess March maybe February, March, he was seized by a desire to move to San Bernardino, which is very close to Loma Linda. And many of you may know that Loma Linda is very closely associated with Seventh-day Adventism. Ellen White had activities there early on in her, well, when I say early on, I'm saying in the early days of Adventism, there was ultimately a hospital established there, which is still there. There's a university established there. Loma Linda is where Perry Jones met Mark Bro, and um, so Vernon wanted to be closer to Loma Linda because then he could go down to Loma Linda and interact and maybe get some converts. So they moved to Loma Linda in early '86, and then in in interacting with Loma Linda and going around the property and observing and. Uh, Vernon would observe the behavior of Adventists. In fact, let me tell this story really quick. Um, this is an interesting story. He, one day, he was... The, Loma Linda is very strictly... Um, there are regulations and rules regarding proselytizing. Obviously, you know, Branch Davidians wouldn't be the only ones passing out literature there. In fact, I had passed out literature at Loma Linda as a child when I was young, years before in the 70s, uh, we, we drove up there one time and we did get apprehended, not apprehended, but we got caught by the security there and we were told to um, leave. So yeah, you, and so the strategy um, when we began to uh, interact with Loma Linda University and the, and the university church and everything and also the medical area there, is we would not violate the rules because if you stayed on the sidewalk you know which is a public sidewalk then it was okay and so we would try to you know try to follow the rules so that you because then ultimately then you won't get in trouble with the whatever the local security there or law enforcement or whatever so um but so one day during this period of time uh vernon howell um somehow got himself into a conflict with some local authority there. I, I think it was mid been on Sabbath day. It would have had to have been, and I'll let you know, because there was Sabbath services going on at the, at the church there in Loma Linda. And they kind of, they kind of grabbed him. It was really weird because these weren't law enforcement officials. They grabbed him. There maybe were deacons or something. And they, um, they stuck him in the in the in a back area where they were. It's kind of like a staging area because you know they're do they do the collections during the services. They pass around the plate or in this case a bucket, up and down the the um, the pews to get money every Sabbath the offerings right. And so they kind of stick him back here where this activity is being coordinated. And it's just you know you sit he, like he's a little kid been caught with his hand in the cookie jar. So weird, but I, I do believe it's a true story. I think he was, um, <laughs> he, uh, they said, you sit here, you know, until they figure out what to do with him, right? I mean, because this is a grown man, obviously. He's, at this point, he's 20, he's 20, 26 years, 27 years old, or 26 years old. <laughs> you know, sit down here. So he kind of just cooperated with him, right? Because I think he claimed, you know, hey, the spirit just said, cooperate so he sits down and then he's observing right so he's he's in the he's in a back room area a behind the scenes kind of area right so the church service is going on and he's back it might have been like there might have been uh windows you know in the back of the church maybe where they can see the service and maybe there was um 
because sometimes they'll funnel microphone. They'll have speakers where they can still hear the service, even if it's soundproof back there or whatever. So that way they can talk. I'm making some assumptions here, but it makes sense based on what I remember him saying. And so he's sitting there and he's watching. You know, he's watching. He, in other words, the idea is, you know, he's the prophet of God. And God has directed him to sit here and, and just accept this, uh, <laughs> accept this temporary imprisonment by questionable authorities, right? I mean, do they really have any authority to, to uh, apprehend and, <laughs> and hold someone, you know? <laughs> um, but anyway, so he sits there because he related this story later. And, um, and so what he related was that he w watched um, them talking about the money you know, like, hey, did we meet our, hey, did we, you know, because after they had brought the money in and they're counting it for the service, you know, hey, did we meet our quota? And then another person goes, yeah, you know, like, like sort of very, um, a, a very, uh, very, I don't know, the attitude towards the money is kind of iffy and not, it doesn't seem to be very godly, I guess, is the idea. Now, this is Koresh's, um, relating the story but you know i i don't have any reason to doubt him in this case i i it kind of makes sense i mean adventists can be pretty they can be pretty money grubbing not all the time but yeah based on other stories so yeah and then he kind of came back you know and related the story like to like god had wanted to show the problem in the church you know that that there is a problem with attitudes towards finances and things like that and he had he had, had some run-ins with maybe some pastors there he would make a, he, uh, I think because they were making a big deal about uh, one time about St. Patrick's Day, maybe, I'm not sure. And he would, con he actually, I think he uh, got, ended up in some pastor's office arguing about, you know, why, why does the Adventist church keep these pagan feast days? You know, so there was a lot of interaction going on at the time. Okay, well, anyway, there was one day where Koresh, um, he encountered this, this was a brochure, uh, this set, this first page here. This is a, a eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper that was folded in two. So this side on the right side would have been the first page, okay? And so this is, this would be directed towards uh, university students. And you know, you can see finally a free flight plan just for students. You won't get a break like this once you're out in the real world. Uh, and it says introducing collegiate flight bank from whatever the hell uh, from Continental New York Air. Okay, yeah. Sign up your friends and earn a Porsche, <laughs> right? A Porsche. Um, introducing collegiate flight, collegiate flight banks so, earn free trips to new york san francisco boston washington dc miami chicago plus australia honolulu london mexico all told 74 cities worthwhile so this is like you know some kind of business deal and then notice that this is a, a note added by um david koresh right or maybe someone under his direction a, a free flight plan to hell <laughs> <laughs> so obviously you can see um, we've got a beach there and we have some very attractive people laying out on the beach having a good time you know well this is uh you know this <laughs> oh man this this got David Koresh going okay and, and I would agree this is kind of counter to um I think the spirit of what Ellen White would be for and against she i think that she would not have approved either probably of course she's from a different time you know this is 1986 um people are wearing less clothes uh though koresh didn't approve of bathing suits like that he thought that that was uh, obviously going too far so let's read the t so then the first page would have been here on this side where it says it says that's enough let me zoom in a little bit so you can whoops um, yeah, let me, uh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, here we go. Okay. That's enough. If you think that the advertisement reproduced on the cover of this article was, was taken from the September 2nd issue, that would be 86 issue of 
Loma Linda Uni of LLU, that's Loma Linda University Observer, is appropriate to represent God's colleges, you had better consider this. Okay? Through association with the world, our institutions, SDA, will become unsubstantial, unreliable, because these worldly elements introduced and placed in positions of trust are looked up to as teachers to be respected in their educating, directing, and official position, and they are sure to be worked upon by the spirit and power of darkness, so that the demarcation becomes not distinguished between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not, Parable is given by Jesus Christ in regard to the field in which it was supposed had been sown pure wheat, but the entrusted ones look upon the field with disappointment and inquire, Didst not thou sow good seed in the field? From whence then hath it tares? The master of the vineyard answers, An enemy hath done this. Testimonies to Ministers, page 265-266. So Testimonies to Ministers is a super, in, in Davidian and Branch Davidian circles, is a super famous um, a book by Ellen G. White and obviously the idea is that ministers will read this book and gather uh, insight and um, instruction from and also obviously we used it to kind of throw back at Adventists hey this is what are you doing you know you're violating your own here's another quote from Testimonies to Ministers let not God's people and any of our institutions sign a truce with the enemy of God and man the duty of the church to the world is not to come down to their ideas and accept their opinions, their suggestions, but to heed the words of Christ through his servant Paul. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial? It says Belial, but that might be a, mis a misspelling. Or what part hath he that believers that believeth with an infidel this means in a special sense marriage with unbelievers but it covers more ground than this it means in our instrumentalities ordained of god in our institutions for health and our colleges and our publishing houses i raise my voice in warning against the mingling in our institutions of the worldly element with those who believe we have the danger signal to sound uh, and obviously, as you can see, I mean, it's not crazy, I would admit, to see a, uh, an advertisement like that where, you know, hey, you can get a, a sports car if you earn it through working in our program and signing up your friends and you can win, get trips to the, to the, around the world and yeah. Uh, okay, so then the world must not be introduced into the church and married to the church, forming a bond of unity. Through, the, through this means a church will indeed become corrupt. Will become indeed corrupt. All right, and then we continue to the next page. As stated in Revelation, a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Okay, and that's Ellen White again in Testimonies in a Minute. We called it TM uh, 265. All right. So here now, we're going to step into um, some text by, uh, this would be by Koresh himself, or maybe dictated to a secretary like Perry Jones or something. The 10th chapter of Revelation holds the precious symbolic key, which understood aright, will shine light on all the books of the Bible. The angel that cries as a lion roars portrays a messenger who teaches the message about the fall of Babylon as recorded in the book of Daniel. The seven thunders were to remain a mystery, for John was not permitted to reveal them. The seven thunders are definitely a mystery. But we are also told by John that in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he has declared to serve the prophet. So at this time, Koresh is pushing this hard, the seventh angel, voice of the seventh angel thing. It's a, it's a really big deal. Um, and Revelation 10, 7, because he's the seventh angel. Okay. We are given repeated counsel by Ellen G. White that the church SDA is not Babylon. See Testimonies to Ministers, page 20, 23, 30, 32, 32, 62. Take special note of the phrases she used in regards to identifying the church. 
We know according to the writings of the apostles that God's church is to have apostles and prophets. Without this divine agency, the church has no direct guidance from God. Without a living voice, the people are left to apply things as they see fit. This is a long time Branch Davidian doctrine. Benjamin Roden uh, banged this drum heavily. Because, see, when Victor Hodup died, um, the Davidians seemed to be content with not thinking that they didn't need a prophet, right? They were just going to coast on through to the kingdom with the writings they had of, of Ellen G. White and then, of course, Victor Hodup. And Benjamin Roden came on the scene in 55 and said, hey, you've got to have a prophet. And he even wrote a track called The Inspiration's Cure for the Davidian Dilemma, which was to not have a prophet. And then, of course, Lois Roden inherited this doctrine. And then, starting out in the Branch Davidians, Vernon Howell obviously inherited this doctrine and also pushed it quite heavily. Uh, that's why it was um, interesting that uh, someone like Clive Doyle, for example, if, if I was to have a conversation with Clive today, I would ask him, well, what about this, Clive? Because you've gone on and believed this message and continued in, your, in the best way he knew how to continue to guess, essentially keep the faith, and he did from the time of the tragedy all the way till his death. But why, what, why wasn't he looking for a prophet? That's a rhetorical question now. I mean, whatever, you know, but that would have, that would have, because to me, that was like a major doctrine. You got to have a prophet. If you're alive and breathing and the end of the world hasn't come yet, then, then long time Branch Davidian doctrine, including under, Dave, under Vernon Howell, um, would have been that you need a prophet. And that's what's being emphasized here. Because, well, because the Adventist church says they have the spirit of prophecy, right? But except that their prophet is dead. So that's would be emphasized. And that he goes and says it right here. Sister White is dead. And the excuse is we have no need of any more prophets because her writings live on. That's absolutely true. Yes, they live about as well in SDA as the Bible does among Sunday keeping Protestants. I think I guess the idea there is that Adventists criticize, you know, other Protestant churches. Uh, they don't seem to know their Bibles very well. And so kind of Koresh you know, or, or Vernon here is throwing it right back at him, right? That criticism back at the SDA. Uh, they live in sackcloth and nobody buries their dead bodies. The third angel did preach that the church in her day was not Babylon. But God, now God calls you to explain how it, it is that the four angels who are holding the winds are in a condition from which they must be loosed from the great river Euphrates. In the days of the voice of the seventh angel, and he's already quoted this before, he's quoting it again, um, emphasizing Revelation 10.7 quite heavily. And behold, here comes a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, all the graven images of her gods he hath broken to the ground the burden of the valley of vision. What aileth thee now that thou art wholly gone up to the housetops? Idol worship. Therefore, said I, look away from me. I will weep bitterly. And then we have to go back to the, um, we have to go back to the first page here. Labor not to comfort me because of the spoiling of the daughter of my people, which is SDA. That's the interpretation there, right? That he's talking about SDA, which again, okay, uh, how do you prove that, right? That's a, that's a rhetorical question. For it is a day of trouble and of treading down and of perplexity by the Lord God of hosts in the valley of vision, breaking down the walls and of crying to the mountains. Isaiah 22 is... Um, a criticism of the leaders of Jerusalem because they don't seem to be preparing very well for the Assyrian invasion. That's my understanding based on reading it. Um, it is time for judgment to begin at the house of God. Study Isaiah 21. Uh, in my opinion, Isaiah 21, it says Babylon has fallen in the... Because uh, the first part of Isaiah is about the Assyrian. Isaiah, more or less, roughly, from Isaiah 1 to chapter 35. And Isaiah 21, Babylon has fallen, very well could be about the, is referring to the Assyrian destruction of Babylon. Because the Assyrians were really hard on Babylon. This is one of the things that kind of Vernon didn't really pay much attention to, is that, you know, there are things going on in the ancient world that are a big deal. 
and this would have been one of them. Now, I don't know that for sure, but it's not. He would. Well, you'll see what he does. If you are the children of God, you would see that Revelation 10 and Revelation 18 reveal this event. God symbolizes Medo-Persia as a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen, and that's because. Um, He's saying Elam was a province of Persia. Cyrus of Persia, an anointed one of God, destroyed Babylon. Uh, the mystery of Isaiah 22 is that the same symbol of chariots and men and horses used to represent the destruction of Judah. Uh, so in other words, what he's saying is that this, uh, like, okay. He's saying Elam equals Persia, okay? That's the equation. And then it's showing them coming up against Judah in Isaiah 22, so the contention is, oh, well, um, well, what's the mystery? It's showing Persia invading and destroying Judah. And he says here, he says, scholars for years have been confused about this prophecy because it is a known fact that Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Babylon, not Persia. Okay, now here's the thing about Vernon. Okay, notice he doesn't cite any scholars. Well, that's because he, this is made up. Okay, so in his mind... Because he thinks that he's super inspired and knows stuff, that he's equated Elam with Persia, and then based on these extrapolations and assumptions, he decides in his head that scholars are really confused about Isaiah 22. Uh, he well, because it's obvious, right, to him, it's they must be, even though he never went and looked it up, any literature on Isaiah 22 or cited any scholars or you know, okay, he hasn't done any of this. <laughs> Trust me, I know. Um, now, the problem is this equating Elam, like a hard locking of Elam with Persia. Like Elam, Elam just straight up equals Persia, period. And that's not really true. Elam is a, is a separate, a separate region with their own separate culture and identity and all that. And sometimes a region would ally with one power or sometimes another. In the time of the Assyrian, Elam was interacting with Assyria. And it's very likely that it's just Elam is one of those nations that is lending their military assistance to Assyria when Assyria came down to invade Judah, which is what the first part of Isaiah is about. Elam is involved. And so there's no, there's no mystery. This is, a, is an imagination, okay? But, you know, this is this is the draw, right? This is the draw. E, Vernon is has a theory about Isaiah 22, and he's baiting people. Oh, scholars are confused. Um, it is a known fact that Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem, not Persia. The facts are that this is a prophecy for the closing up of the sixth seal to the church first. Um, the first ones to cry out to the mountains is not the Babylon of the world, but the ones whom Sister White spoke of long ago. See Isaiah 22, 6, uh, 2, 2 through 22, 24, 18, Hosea 10, 8. Um, okay, so here we go. We're going to close with this. Uh, this is gonna, we're going we're gonna to try to scare people with a vision from Ellen G. White. That night I dreamed that I was in Battle Creek looking out from the side glass at the door and I saw a company marching up to the house, two and two. They looked stern and determined. I knew them well, and turned to open the parlor door to receive them, but thought I would look again. The scene was changed. The company now presented in the appearance of Catholic procession. One bore in his hand a cross, another a reed. And as they approached, the one carrying a reed made a circle around the house, saying three times, This house is prescribed. The goods must be confiscated. They have spoken against our holy order. Terror seized me, and I ran through the house out of the north door and found myself in the midst of a company, some of whom I knew, but I dare not speak a word to them for fear of being betrayed. I wept and prayed much as I saw her goods confiscated. Uh, Ellen White had an active imagination. <laughs> I, I read stuff like this now, quite frankly, and yeah, I'm like, you know, um, you need to relax a little bit. Anyway. Uh, the angel of testimony, that's Testimonies, Volume 1, page 578. The angel from the east with the seal of the living God is here to seal the true church of God, the ones who will stand on Mount Zion with the Lamb. Uh, this is, again, 
Uh, this is beating the old drum all the way back from hottest days. This is what his deal was. Okay, to seal to seal the ones that will stand on Mount Zion with the Lamb. At this point, David uh, Vernon Howell is not claiming to be the Lamb yet. This would still be Jesus in his mind, you know, conventional uh, theology. And then he quotes some scriptures to see Isaiah 16, 1 and 2, which is the one about uh, Sandy the Lamb to the ruler Lamb. Uh, which maybe he's drifting that way, though, because he thought that lamb was him. Psalm 11, Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 12, 1 through 4, that's uh, he shall rise up at the voice of the bird. Amos 3, 7, uh, I think that's God will do nothing but reveal his secret to the servants, the prophets. And then he's got in caps, hear, hear the voice of the seventh angel. Um, for studies, call, and this was the number for the San Bernardino house, or right, and this was the Palestine camp address here, or at least the P.O. box in town. Um, yeah. So, there you go. Um, anyway, I'll read my comment here. To hell, that was, you know, this little, um, this little thing here. To hell, this comment was added by Koresh. The catalyst for this track was the ad appearing here. In a student publication at Loma Linda University, Crush was trying living with some members at a house in San Bernardino. You know, spent a lot of time proselytizing at the university. This represented the worldliness he felt was creeping into the church and used it as a talking point to get attention of Adventists who would listen. Yeah. So there you go. So um, yeah, a little a little look into history, into um, uh. Yeah, this, this is typical of the kind of activity that he was involved with at the time. And so we didn't pass out a lot of tracks, but in this case, this is like a quick little track, which is just, and it's actually, to me, a really, um, it's a really efficient way to make a track. You just get an eight and a half piece of 11 paper, you know, fold it in two, and you got a four page track. You've got a zinger on the front, right? You've got a um, an attention grabber on the front, right? And then on the inside, you've got... Um, the, the main text. Uh, to me, this is a little bit wordy. I would have done better here and made done less verbiage, but whatever. And then on the back, um, obviously, you have some contact information. There's some branch tracks that followed this formula really well. And, you know, if you're going to do a tract, it just needs to be short and quick and and really, um, you know, at the, you get the best chance you're going to have. But under Lois Roden, she would make these, and also how to make these super long multi-page tracks with tiny fine print like nobody's gonna read that because i mean the model was you like hand it to somebody right or you put it on their car that's what we used to do when i was a kid i grew up doing this like oh because i was a little kid I, it's almost like nobody would suspect a little kid right because this really wasn't allowed at adventist churches or or camp meetings and i just i mean we i would i can assume that 99.999 percent of all this stuff just ended in the trash it was an enormous waste of resources, in my opinion. So anyway, there you go. little short look in 1986 um, history lesson to kind of give you an idea of what was going on. Uh, Till next time, take care.